Hello, welcome. Thanks for bearing with us. Uh, we had a few technical internet related difficulties, so we're starting a few minutes late tonight, but we're really excited to be with you all for our fourth, can you all believe it? Fourth um, Thursday night live, live streaming event. You have joined us before, you, you'll probably have a little bit of a sense of what we're trying to do with this, but if you're new to the Thursday Night Live broadcast, um, it is really a dynamic uh, live event with the Wellness Resource Center staff where we're talking about kind of stuff related to the day, both the adjustment to our current COVID world and uh, how those things relate to wellness topics and programs that we've experienced recently. Um, we do have a few ground rules in the sense that we want this experience for you to be as much like interacting with us if we were all on campus together and in the same room together. So we really want you to interact with us. So we'll be monitoring the chat. Please do write in your comments, questions, ideas. Um, we really want to interact with you. Um, so I encourage you to do that. And if you've interacted with us on campus before, you know that we are really committed to um, creating spaces that are um, compassionate and respectful and trauma-informed in both language and behavior. And so those are our expectations as we interact with you tonight. Our topic today, if you're, if you're familiar with the broadcast, we've had sort of a theme every week. And this week, we were kind of thinking about our the way that um, the current stay at home or and being disconnected from our campus community in a lot of respects. Um, how that is feeling and how we're engaging with that and I was thinking about in particular, the fact that in the wellness resource center we take this very holistic approach to understanding well being and understanding ourselves as human beings. And um, so just kind of thinking about those connections and disconnections. And one of the things that we were talking about as a staff was what does normalcy look like in this moment? And, and I'll, I'll pass it off to my lovely colleagues. It looks like maybe we lost Montana, but hopefully she'll, she'll join us again. But um, what does normalcy look like to you all in this moment? Well, actually, it's funny because pre-pandemic, I don't, what was normal didn't seem like it should be normal. Um, a lot of people unable to, you know, afford a $600 emergency. That was a statistic for Americans, like some, at least 75% would not be able to handle like a $600 emergency, something like that. Um, you know, mass incarceration, the, you know, the most incarcerated country in the world. So, I mean, I guess that was normal, but I hope we don't go back to it after this. <laughs> um, but yeah, normal, I mean, for me, like what I would want in a society is, I want normalcy to look like a healthy community where individuals can be healthy and, um, you know, people have equal rights and there's a lot less violence and inequality in, the war in our country and society, but, I'd like that to be our normal, but um, that's that's what I envision for myself or for us at the moment. Definitely, I second that, and I'm gonna be the the one odd one out here on my come calling on my cell phone. But I couldn't agree more, Anna. I was actually just reading a, an article of title, um, or talking about a proposed stimulus bill that would give I think it was like two thousand dollars a month. And, and relief to people and I felt so shocked and then I noticed how shocked I felt and I was like why do I feel so surprised about this this potential change in my living you know way of doing things I've never really that doesn't like legislation like that I think represents a change in the America that I have grown up to know and kind of the value that like a lot of Americans feel like legislature should reflect so 
I was so shocked to hear that, and now I'm just kind of noticing that reaction and wondering what else is to come like that. And I know a lot of um, folks in the academic fields are also kind of talking in this way. So I, any faculty are listening or, you know, any students who are listening who are kind of taking classes or thinking academically about a future lens, I'm really interested in hearing about what you are, you know, what are you talking about? Because that's, that's definitely what my, where my mind is going. It's like, okay, what does our future really look like, a shared future? Well, I think a lot of Americans do are, you know, people who weren't so engaged before or really up on things, they're starting to see the like clear fault lines with, um, you know, our government and the things they actually are able to do. Like, oh, you can just send a bunch of money to Americans at whatever, anytime. Oh, maybe we can do, let's, how about um, you start doing that more after the pandemic? Um, and they're sending a lot more to wealthy people and non-human entities like corporations. And so people are kind of like finding that, oh, this whole money thing is kind of fake. <laughs> I mean, it's really like given value because of uh, government and where it goes, but people are starting to realize that there's a lot more the government can be doing for its people than it has been doing slash they have the ability to really harm people or actually really make it people's lives better. So I really hope that people realize that. And after this, like, don't let up on the people running our country because, I mean, honestly, they kind of look like they want people dead in our country at this point, moment in time. So, but like, even with that $1,200 like, that people were getting, I think people were just like, oh, wait, we do have money. Oh, not everyone, we don't have to live like this. Like just hand to mouth every day. So, Heather, I think you're you're muted still. That relates to something that we were talking about a couple of days ago in terms of like the illusions that we have about ourselves often, right? Our perception of how we operate or things like this that the pandemic has maybe given us a little bit of insight into. Um, but yeah, I think it has given us a lot of insight into the way that government functions and the illusions that we might have held about how our civil servants and, you know, different kinds of, of um, people who are, are serving us um, are not serving us in the ways that, you know, like frontline people right now are serving the American people, right? Um, healthcare workers, emergency services, our grocery store employees, all of these folks are, they're the ones that are serving us in this moment, I feel like. And I, it gives me a sense of tremendous gratitude to like think about those folks, but I'm with you, Anna, also like, frustration and anger at the other folks who are supposed to be serving us. Yeah, and it's really interesting with like grocery store workers, cause like I'm thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is bad, but I'm like, I hope they keep showing up to work. We need that, you know what I mean? We need them, but then I feel the sense of guilt cause I know how under, they're not, pay, un, they're underpaid, you know, and they're ex being exposed to. And like, I remember like just thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope these employees who really don't, aren't incentivized to show up based on pay and danger show up and it's like you depend on them and so I think it makes people realize I mean I don't think you should have to work to be able to survive and live but like people start having more gratitude for those workers and caring about things like minimum wage and so on yeah I just to add on to that Anna I um watched a movie recently with my friend and called um I think the full title is McFarland USA. It's a Disney film about a running team um, assembled by this guy <laughs> who like comes into town basically, but the town is a farming town in Northern California. And um, I don't know, I'm just, movies like that and like seeing farm worker justice related content on like some of my social media feeds 
does, I think, also just bear repeating that the people, in light of that kind of content, the people who pick our food, like, of course they should be essential workers. I do not understand why this was kind of, like, if that's news to somebody, I think that's maybe perhaps indicative of kind of how they've chosen to curate their, like, information feed, because, like, who doesn't know that, you know, people are, undocumented people are the people who pick our strawberries, who pick our apple, like, they feed America, and so to be kind of dismissive of some truth, I think that that, that perhaps that, that, it, that fracture, I guess, or like that kind of tension between like where are we get all getting our information from, I think that that's also being like really, uh, I don't know, just kind of spotlighted in this moment. Because for those of us who have been championing like farm workers' rights, who have been known that farm workers are essential people in this country, regardless of what a paper says, like, this is not news that they're, you know, still working and stuff. So, yeah, I think conversations about class and, and race and therefore every other salient part of identity that is, like, associated with that, my hope is that conversations are, like, still kind of continuing. Because I've been having them in my house, and that's, like, really been a part of how I'm making sense of this, this moment. I wonder if you all feel like um, I feel like in our first broadcast we were talking about the possibility that this pandemic and the impact that it's had on our on our communities um, that we've been seeing maybe a little bit more grace from people and hoping that that lasts. And I wonder how hopeful y'all are feeling about the idea that maybe people are recognizing how their individual well-being depends upon their entire community and um, that that community being well, maybe, maybe that is I was just as you were talking, I was I was thinking, oh, that that really ties in with like how maybe we should be approaching our work in terms of helping people to see those those kinds of connections to community that hit their bottom line, I guess, in some ways. Yeah, not to be all negative or whatever, like, I'm not gonna be too negative. But um, like, I am hopeful for like people to be grateful and graceful. But like the past week of seeing those protests of people, um, I mean, that a photo went viral at the Ohio State House of like all these MAGA people like looking in looking like zombies or something. But that has scared me a little bit. I think like, is it is there always gonna be that portion of the population, you know, like I want a haircut, like they're literally, like her, this woman's haircut's more important than, you know, putting pe humans in danger and exposing them. And so, yeah, that put me a little bit, a little pause on my hopes for afterwards. Cause like, you know, we're a month, what are we like a month and a half into this and people are behaving this way. <laughs> but um, that being said, or is another pop group of people who are like pushing back. I mean, there's always there's resistance that's there, I think. And um, I don't know, but yeah, I assume some of you have seen coverage about those protests happening. <laughs> and then like a woman got arrested at a playground or something because she refused to leave. And I don't, I don't know what to make of it when like we're in the midst of it and they're not trying to the community first yeah i just to kind of build what you were saying anna one of the points that we kind of wanted to bring up tonight is about like points of growth and how facing fears can be a point of growth and i think the things that you're talking about are like actually some of my worst fears that like my community just doesn't care like apathy is something that really frightens me because it's just it's you know i don't know it's maybe a slippery slope and maybe that's not even descriptive enough but i feel like once we stop caring then what 
then what do we do? We just sit <laughs> and not care. Well, it's so funny that you say that. So I've been really like observing like the public health messaging on like the local level, state level and federal level. And then there's like private, there's like some private company messaging. Like, I don't know if you've seen this Kaiser Permanente um, commercial, like it's coming up on Hulu. Like the, literally the public health messaging is encouraging empathy and like being like, <laughs> like what does that say about us? Like it's literally encouraging people like, without saying like you live in a society like it's just like very basic compassion that public health messaging is doing right now and like i don't know what that says about us um it's a little worrisome but like yeah it, just knowing that people caring about others would improve things vastly um and then what was the other i was going to say but yeah i guess given the way our society set up being very highly individualistic as opposed to like a collectivist society mm -hmm requires that type of messaging because we're not socialized to think that way i guess so it's I like also, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah i was just going to build on your point i also think that there's so much <clears throat> like different messaging that is kind of drawing people in different ways and having people draw different conclusions that that's almost like the base like thing that everybody should hopefully be able to connect on just like let's think of each other and let's look out for each other you know regardless of all of these different messages that people are, are receiving but it is true that like prevention work um you know i've been i've been doing prevention work for um many many years now and um at the heart often of trying to get people to change their behavior is trying to get them to feel empathy for someone else because their behavior harms them right and and um even though i feel like i'm a pretty optimistic person in a lot of respects um and i've seen so many like so many people harmed um, you'd think I would be really jaded about human behavior, but I'm constantly surprised by, by, you know, essentially crappy behavior by people. But that's a good reminder, Anna, that that maybe we do have to just consistently remind people um, that they are human like these other people and how do we help them have empathy for others. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be the conclusion you and the public health field has found. And yeah, I agree. I mean, that, that we emphasize that a lot in our own prevention work about what, you know, getting rid of violence requires a community response and like community solidarity and care. So. I think that is so interesting and disheartening, Anna. I've also like, I think this week seeing those protests like really also hit a nerve in me that made me feel just like really, really um, disheartened. And I think um, I was sharing with the WRC team earlier. I um, listened to a talk from Arundhati Roy this morning, who's like, I'm just think is the most brilliant. And I think that was like something that made me feel hopeful that um i had i hadn't been and a lot of it had to do with those protests but i think that 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 notion of individualism just feels like one of the more salient kind of themes to this like pandemic i think like the myth of individualism and how that myth both like put us in the situation where we are so unprepared to meet um to meet the needs of a pandemic because i think it has so much to do with like the fact that we don't that we, like, you know we're so privatized in our in our ability to like support people um and that also like how deep that is in like the fabric of our kind of culture and and our our societal structures that like 
it's so hard to even move through this time and to educate people on like what is needed to move through this time because everything that is necessary runs counter to the individualism that's like at the, the center of so much of like what capitalism is and what like I guess like notions of like Americanism are related to especially yikes <laughs> I think especially for like Colorado College's campus though I think there's a lot of hope to be found in community oriented thinking like in January and February we saw that our Chinese international students were incredibly distressed right at the same time I know quite a few of them who traveled and did this and that and did these drives to acquire masks to send back home um you know get supplies back to their house or back to their homes in China so to me that points to like you know ability to draw together and do things so like I think they're like, what we want like I there are examples of that on campus too that I think we could learn from but I, I do remember when this was early on in January and February when we came back and it's like really on the periphery of my mind but the but I do remember reading and listening to students talking about what they were doing to collect supplies to send home with the, like the doing it with each other. So. Mm. You know, I feel like in my opinion, your comment kind of highlights the need for documentation and like really intentional, like archiving of how we're moving through right now which is why I'm pretty glad to be participating in things like this because I think I'm young, like I'm, I'm 23. I have, you know, hopefully a, a big long life ahead of me. And so being able to look back and like just reflect on this moment and be able to hear myself really speak about how I'm feeling and what we're doing. I mean, I think the documentation piece is invaluable, which is why um, not, not to be a shameless plug actually, block break bingo. Uh, that's quite the mouthful, is still in full effect, students, if you're listening. I would do it if I could. Like, I'm going to be honest, it doesn't seem like it takes too much out of folks. If you have some spare time and some, some energy, I mean, hey, why not? But, yeah, I I think that the, the peripheralness that I also felt, Anna, is really only indicative of, like, detachment from, detachment from, I'll say that and likely a relative amount of privilege too. And so to be, I'm thinking of the of this uh, video that we looked at back many weeks ago now. Um, it was like a time people talking to themselves, like a certain amount of time kind of three before that moment. And I'm thinking like, hmm, what would I say to myself like three or four or five or six weeks ago? What would I change or would I do things the same way? When we were uh, doing some planning for tonight's broadcast, we were talking about um, the idea of growth and, and how we grow individually in this community. And one of the things that had come up that's kind of an, a, a challenge and maybe a gift is the idea of self-talk in a WebEx world, in a, in a Zoom world. And um, all the things that y'all were just talking about really were connected for me, um, you know, the, the lack of empathy that people are having and how that comes back to, if I put my empathy hat on <laughs> um, with those people, like um, their, their sense of, of insecurity and fear that a lot of people, right, we know in our political process, people, um, capitalize on fear and try to build fear in order to get certain goals met and things like that. And so it really, um, this week in mindful stress management, um, we were doing a, a self-compassion exercise and there's, there's something in, um, Buddhist practice that is a, and mindfulness practice, which is a, a loving kindness meditation and one of the things that i find really striking about that is that in a loving kindness meditation you start 
with extending love to yourself, then you extend it to a broad community, all people sort of way, and then you extend it to people you have conflict with. And um, I think that maybe says something to us about like we may, we do have to start here, right? Of of how do we ourselves demonstrate care and empathy and self compassion, and then how do we extend that? to our community and in doing so, maybe that's part of our prevention work. Cause I was also thinking about the fact that we use our social ecological model, which talks about all these different levels, individual, um, interpersonal, community, societal, and that all of those things are connected. And we have to, we have to always start with ourselves when we think about where, where we're at and then, um, I'm starting to ramble a little bit, but <laughs> how we connect um, compassion for self with compassion for community and then how that helps us to build the community we really want to live in. That also makes me think about just in terms of self-talk and growth over this period. I think I've maybe shared before, but um, I've noticed that like in this in this period, because the kind of like threat of um, freak out and anxiety and just like fear is so immediate, it's made me like really double down on myself in terms of my like coping strategies and noticing my self talk, whereas like because because I have to to you know like when we think about the spectrum of wellness from you know like unwell what is it it's unwell coping or has someone help me out unwell struggling coping well yeah spectrum <laughs> but I think that like there are things that that this pandemic kind of like immediately puts us in the threat of being of like more towards unwell, just in the sense that like that, that physical unwellness, like the threat of it is so immediate and the amount of like mental anxiety that that causes. So I think just like how, um, like adamant I am with myself about like maintaining those practices has been so heightened even though like i always have anxiety i always should be doing them because that's just like i'm someone who like experiences anxiety frequently but like the uh, my awareness is so is just like so high of how of like the kind of like cognitive processes that are going on because i'm like montana you better be on top of this or <laughs> like it is a slippery slope or we are in a pandemic like do your mindful practices, like all of those things. And I think that ultimately that will be something that is like good because it's putting those, those, those strategies to the test and like, you know, really showing me that I can employ them and they will help. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Oof, Montana, this back, nothing but like poetry snaps. I maybe kind of want to throw into the mix a question that we have here on our our side that we were thinking to talk about tonight. Um, that's how do you build self care, rest, relaxation into your daily life? Um, I feel like that's kind of where the conversation is leading us. Um, I know that I just I really feel the word practice. Like I just I feel it in everything that I do. I am hardcore practicing things right now. And I feel like that's kind of what you're speaking to Montana. So maybe we can, I don't know, yeah, talk about how, how are we building those things. And I saw this post that actually since we're all gathered here, I would really like for us to, um, as a team, maybe share our response to this post that I saw. Um, and the, an illustrator, she created this thing that said like, what, um, what comfort item are you grateful for today? And I thought that was a very specific type of gratitude question that like I immediately thought of a great answer for and it just put a smile on my face. 
So yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, I want to hear how, how are y'all building? What are you building? Well, what was your comfort item, if you don't mind sharing? <laughs> it was, it's these pair of like, I'm looking at them because I'm wearing them right now. Um, these like pair of house shoes that I like to wear. They're light purple, they're from Rihanna, her line. I'm a big fan, if uh, you didn't know. And they're just fuzzy and they're kind of beat up. I'm not going to lie to y'all. Um, but like, I don't know, it was there a gift from someone who I care about and they just, there's these fuzzy shoes that just make me feel a little fuzzy inside and I like that. So I guess for me, it's kind of linked to the feeling, the tact, the, the, the qualities of the object. And I like thinking about that. What are the things in my life that make me feel okay? <laughs> First, that's a great comfort item. Um, I would say my items are just like the fuzzy pets that I have because it's just very relaxing petting them if, if they don't bite you, speaking of one. But, um, and then the um, other thing I was gonna say is interesting, it's a little corn, okay. Yeah, this one's stressing me out, she's. Um, so it's kind of corny, but I did it at the beginning of the year is like having a gratitude jar. Like we just have a mason jar with post-its next to it. So like, you know, it's not, we don't make ourselves do it every day, but like if something happened that day, that was really nice, you know, we write that down like, or, um, or it could just be something you think about that you're really grateful for. And so you write this down. Since the pandemic has started, our gratefulness jar has not been getting an, uh, um, quite, quite enough action I've noticed. And so like, it's one of those practicing things, you, like, you know, we were putting things in it like once or twice a week, but I think it's gone a few weeks without us putting anything in it. And like Montana was saying like, this is the time when you really need to use those things. Um, so I think Jeremy put in like, we got through March or something. That was the only thing that's entered the jar, but there's been a lot of good th things to be grateful for that we should probably, you know, keep using that. <laughs> And like, and like Iso is saying, for documentation purposes, like I think it would be interesting to look back on some of these things too. I had a stress ball that I was playing with a lot today. I don't know where it went, but I have just like, I just found it today and I've just been having it in my hand while I'm working and and I used to do that in my office all the time, like just have a stress ball while I was like reading stuff or whatnot. I don't know where it went, but I was holding on to it today and it felt pretty comforting. And I think it got my mind jogging a little bit. I think um, comfort item for me would be, um, we have these fleece blankets that sit on our sofa because I think we were talking earlier about the fact that my um, my uh, housemates, my partner and I have uh, different temperatures that we prefer. And so um, I, I pull that fleece blanket across myself a lot and I love the, the tactile nature of it. Not only does it, you know, make me warm and I like pull it up under my chin, tuck it back around my neck. So I'm completely covered in fleece and, um, but it's soft and that's comforting. I find that sort of tactile thing really comforting. Um, and I'm, I'm really always grateful for beautiful things. And when I can connect to a sense of beauty, whether that's about like, a person does a really beautiful thing and, and that um, makes me feel good or the um, the mountains and the, the clouds moving across them, that sense of beauty or um, connecting. I'm, I'm in, incredibly grateful for the art that I'm able to have in my home and that um, is, is grounding for me because it's, it's beautiful and I can appreciate that and be present in that moment and so those are the things that help me and comfort me 
yeah, I think locally we're really lucky to have these mountains <laughs> to look at for sure. So I'm, I find myself looking at them a lot. Uh, like, yeah, like you said, just recognizing their beauty and just, you know, they look really cool at different times of the day. So it's, I think we're lucky to have such natural beauty around us here. Yeah, I will definitely agree with that point. Um, I think my, I was, my comfort item right now, um, <laughs> I think is my breakfast burrito <laughs> every morning. Um, my roommates have been kind of making fun of me for how consistently I make myself a breakfast burrito and like have the routine down like like to such a science of like my eggs and cheese and veggies and the tortilla and like heating them up and cooking them and folding it and eating it with like a, in a very small amount of time. But like, oh my God, I just like love those things so much. And I have the, that, what's it? Like 505 green chili that I put on it from Costco and I love it. And it just like starts my morning off right every single morning. And I like wake up stoked for making my breakfast burrito. Um, Hold on, mention that chili again. Five, did you say 505? I think it's 505. I'm gonna, I'll double check. Let me look it up. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's just like so good. And Louisa um, got me on it last year and I've never turned mm -hmm. back. So, yeah, it uh, is. It's 505. I just checked. Mm -hmm. That's the um, uh, area code of Albuquerque, New Mexico, which has the best green chili in the world, chili capital of the world. So shout out to Mexico for that one. This is also why Louisa got me on it, because that's where they're from. Like, yeah, I think like Isa was saying, and I'll just like say it again and say it a million times. I think that practice aspect of this is just like coming in for me every single day and like practicing even keeping the routine as part of that too, or like having a routine and developing one. But my breakfast burrito making, I've practiced real well. And so that's that's really solid. And it brings me a lot of comfort. Maybe, maybe you could share a recipe or share like a video of you making it or something, just like prop your phone up to show your hands or something. I, for, just for me, Monte, you do even have to share it with, you know, I care about the WRC community, but even just between us friends, <laughs> like help me out. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll do that this morning. I'll video myself making it. Oh, so cool. I love a good burrito. Uh, food has food has been a really great source of like nourishment in every sense right now. And I've been cooking a good amount, but also treating myself to like eating out. Um, I'm a big, we have food at the house kind of person though. so. Eating out does feel like a treat these days, but yeah, the food at the house has been great. I cannot lie. I mean, I've been feeling like a chef lately. Got some matcha powder. I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> yeah, we've been eating pretty well at our house too. And um, I have definitely been indulging in one of my favorite foods, which is cheese. Um, and I enjoy the whole process of that. Like, I love eating cheese. I love cheese, almost every kind of cheese. Um, but I like creating a beautiful spread. So like having a nice board and, and arranging the cheese and the crackers and maybe apple slices or whatever, nuts, whatever that might be. But I, I, it, the whole process is nurturing to me. Um, and food is nurturing, right? I also want to mm -hmm. throw in there, um, like when we're talking about things that bring comfort and kind of keep you level headed that I've, um, I felt like I'm more in touch with like younger people now because I joined a discord server which is like a big chat room and um, I didn't realize like that I was missing kind of like that online 
forum community, like having conversation in real time. And I'm learning so much about like memes that I did. I thought I knew memes, but like they're always changing, ever changing. And it's, it's just, I didn't know that there were so many like specific communities out there around like music, cooking, lots of different things. And when I was growing up, I, you know, would go on like AOL Instant Messenger, Yahoo chat rooms or whatever. And then I kind of got away from that. And it's been really nice, like rediscovering all these really like interconnected communities online. And there's lots of different like programs and, and companies and websites now that are facilitating a lot of those things. I, I think um, I have spent a little bit more time on TikTok lately, and it just, it's for the better. I can't lie. I think that my life is much more, I don't know, I feel really connected to a community and pretty, it's kind of new. I, I also got away from like what that feels like. Also, if you're interested, I wasn't really super into Club Penguin, but it was like an online gaming thing that like is went away and is now back, and it's kind of a big deal. So it's, you're like into Club Penguin and haven't heard about this, it is back on the market for you. But online gaming, I mean, it's, it's, it's a thing and I'm, I'm into it. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but you know, stuff that like we have Scrabble and Bananagrams and the tactile games that also hopefully are getting played. I, I, I wish that my roommate liked Bananagrams as much as I do, because I do just love a good game in general. It's a good way to pass the time. Card games, maybe we could do like a game like swap kind of like skill share thing. Somebody teach me Egyptian rat screw and all. I don't know. Even my secrets to banana grams, none. But yeah, the game games are a big part of my life right now, for sure. Definitely. My house has gotten really into drawful. I don't know if you all know what that is. It's like um I think it's through the switch actually. One of my roommates has a switch and it's like they give you, it's kind of like Pictionary, like they like give you prompts and you have to draw a pro the prompt and everyone sends it in and like then comes up with the title that they think that other people have drawn. And it's just like a whole silly mess, basically. But that's been like a really fun one for everyone to do together. That sounds really fun. We've been playing a lot of games at our house too. And um, we've been playing a lot of Settlers of Catan, um, which uh, we get pretty silly about. Um, if anybody's familiar with Settlers of, of Catan, um, all the sheep in my manger have names. I name all of all of my sheep when I when I have them. So um, that that brings me joy and happiness too. That's awesome, Heather. I love that game. It does take a little bit to like figure it out. Um, uh -huh. And and I I have to say I'm not I try to be a strategic thinker, like in my like in work. I feel like there are lots of ways in which I'm a very strategic thinker, but in games, like Scrabble, I love Scrabble, but um I just like getting a really good word. And so sometimes I'll get an awesome word, but not very few points. Um, I'm not very strategic in game playing. My favorite thing about that game is um, it's like a different experience every time. You know, like you set up the game board different every time. You can choose how to play however you want you know, any which way, every time. It's a really cool game. And there's also an online version of that game too that I used to play, that you can just log in and play with people all around the world. Yes, I, I saw people promoting that as like a fun way to pass the time online. That and like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, there's a lot more. I can't even, like I've never been into that stuff. My brother was into it in high school but a lot of my friends are suddenly like interested in getting into it. So 
I think it's great wholesome fun for people to do if they want. <laughs> I also have never been into like I've never been into video games and I've never done much game gaming but that's been something that's been really interesting to me like some of the people I'm around a lot during this time like have these different games that they play a lot like Animal Crossing is one that comes up a lot and the like I've just realized how first how that can be such an important like anxiety management system and like way of just actually practicing mindfulness and like really i mean i know we have the switch in our office for that reason um but yeah i think that like i've just like seen that on an individual level more how the ways that that that's become really useful in this time and managing anxiety during this whole like process and like i'm seeing it even though that's not really something that like I practice or I don't think works for me as much. I, I feel like this conversation kind of is just part two of last week in a lot of ways, because I think this conversation about like online gaming in particular does open us up to talk about like being an active bystander and opportunities to be an active bystander, which can be like especially prevalent in online gaming world, particularly I'm not real savvy but like i was on club penguin and i mean like people were kind of people got raunchy on club penguin and i was like dang like this is kind of a lot and i and i've heard clips of like what happens on other like servers or whatever but i i know it can get rough and also not always obviously but like yeah i think just to kind of connect last week and this week like even in our even in our chosen mode of like relaxation or self-care being an active bystander is like part of promoting that community care while we're performing self-care. Yeah. That's cool. I love that idea of being an active bystander in the virtual world with your you know, virtual characters or whatever, because it's still at the end of the day, real people like with real feelings, you know, acting out against each other, you know, and, and people I think are mostly doing it to relax, to have fun those sorts mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. it's interesting to me that folks are um doing like online gaming for their for their sort of um downtime relaxation time because i am spending so much time on my computer and and so much time that you know like in my current role at the college, I, I go to lots of meetings. And, and all of those meetings used to involve me walking across campus and then sitting in a room with people. And, and now they're me in my little space looking at a, at a screen. Um, but it's interesting to think about how this pandemic and the stay at home orders and all of that maybe is making us reflect on what do we want to fill our days with? What do we want to spend our time on? What's worth it to us? What do we, you know, how does it feed us or our community to engage in, in certain things? And um, I think for me, we often spent a lot of time on the weekends, you know, sort of running errands. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, you know, I, I've essentially not stepped out of my house since last Sunday when I went to the grocery store. And so, um, like, I certainly realize I don't, what was I running? I'm not exactly sure what I was doing with all those errands. I think we were just going like multiple places to get things. And now we're like, what do we really need? Um, and it's the same with, um, with the activities that we're doing, you know, there are things that I just am like, this I don't want to spend my time on, but this I do because it feeds my soul or helps my community or helps my family. I'm curious if you all have those thoughts too. Mm -hmm. I definitely had that experience recently when I took down my braids. It took several, I broke it up over a few days. So I was like, I cannot sit and do this in several hours don't have the patience. 
Um, and I thought long and hard about like, what does it mean for me to spend hours on my hair? Like, what do, how do I feel about that? And I kind of sat with it and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, it's me. I deserve it. All right. I have a, I have a few hours for, for my hair <laughs> um, every so often. So that's definitely where I felt that the most, Heather. I, I hear you 1000% that like my days have not felt this free in forever. Like probably just like so long. Alex just actually made a comment the other day that like we I haven't had like I haven't not had homework to do like in downtime, literally ever. It's like it's so new. It's so new. One of the things we often talk about in our work and with students is our culture of busyness at Colorado College and the fact that, you know, um, as students are coming to CC, part of what attracts them is the myriad opportunities for clubs and activities and all of those kinds of things. And then it feels like often they get to CC and sort of say, okay, it's all available to me. I should be doing it all, right? And so I think I asked y'all earlier if you were optimistic about um, some positive uh, social things coming from all of this, but I wonder what level of optimism you have about if other people are having those same kinds of thoughts about like, what, what's really important to me? How do I really want to spend my time? How optimistic do you feel about that translating back to the environment of like everybody being at work and everybody being on campus? Your long thoughtfulness is, is I think, giving us some answers. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like um, I, I could see an experience where that presents more challenges coming back to campus because, you know, uh, maybe people have figured out, you know, new things that they really want to integrate into their lives and, you know, you're going into an environment where, um, you know, you're going to be busy you know throughout the academic year and then what do you sacrifice if you want to keep some of those things that you want to continue doing over this time and how do you yeah like how do you integrate all of these new things that you discovered are helpful for you here if they're still like relevant throughout the academic year that's kind of where my mind went to first And I also feel like that's something that hopefully our office will be like uh, helpful in in supporting students like think through and supporting the rest of campus and thinking through and will be active and also like continuing to assess that ourselves because I think like yeah that you know I think we've talked a lot about like what aspects of of this experience will we really want to keep and like i think that not feeling what you said you i feel like you have some thoughts around like what it means to be filling up our days um but having them yeah not be packed so full and just this idea that right now because we're you know we literally can't do so ma so many things we're not allowed to and because there's different expectations because of the fact that we're you know, dealing with a pandemic and just trying to take care of ourselves, but like, there's just less obligations. And I think that that's gonna be something that like, that that would be positive to try to really, really think, think about adding those back in. And like, do I, does this really add meaning for me, you know? Yeah, I, I feel very open to just seeing kind of what happens. I feel like 
I don't, I, I don't think I know. I don't think I can make any kind of prediction. At least I see research on anything is that pretty much anything can, can happen pretty quickly. So I'm just going to be hopeful that, that this moment really provided a look, a, a moment to look in the mirror. I feel like that was the visual that I was getting earlier in this conversation. I was going to um, actually think from Michael Jackson, but I won't. But um, I really do feel like I'm starting with the woman in the mirror. Like that's kind of where my mind and heart are at right now. And I, of course, I am thinking about my community always. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But like, I'm also. It feels like I'm allowing a little, a little self-centering right now. Maybe not self-centeredness, but like, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of my answer to the. To any question about the future right now, like I have my ideas, I have my thoughts, but honestly, at the end of the day, like I'm thinking about, you know, catching the sunset, like after our conversation, I, I feel a little more levity in like being able to balance my right now with the future because anything can happen. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, and since like there's so much uncertainty around the future and what's happening next, you're like kind of forced to be in the moment, which, um, you know, can be good and bad. But like so, so many people are so forward planning their future, forward thinking that now that it's a little up in the air right now, you're kind of forced to uh, back up off that a little bit. But I hope when you know a return to campus means, I don't know, maybe people won't feel, there's like the sense of guilt if you're not busy enough or not doing enough. I hope that that type, that part of the culture can go away where you don't have to feel guilty about maybe just doing a class this block, that's all you need, like, and not piling yourself with all these other obligations. And maybe that'll happen a lot of, among a lot of people, I don't know, but that would be good to see, I think. Yeah, it, that would be an amazing thing to see. And I know we're coming up on time here, or maybe even a little over, but I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I just kind of want to like nuance it and maybe then we can add thoughts and close out. But like when I was a student, I had a pretty like, I thought I knew what I needed and like that I was doing everything because I needed to be doing it. But like, it wasn't until like I kind of had some perspective that like, okay, even though I had two jobs all four years, like, I dropped one of my jobs because I started feeling really bad. My body started feeling really terrible and I was feeling stressed so acutely that I just needed to cut back. And like, I think that for students for whom like financial obligations, family pressure and like expectations, um, and just other kinds of students who are maybe like just feel like they're just getting by at CC or like feeling imposter syndrome or feeling like I don't deserve to rest like you do, <laughs> you always do. And so my hope for those students is that even if home isn't a restful place, that like this this home can be a restful place. And that's what I think I'm learning to cultivate over this moment. And like practicing, <laughs> just practicing, practicing, practicing. Well, that seems like a lovely place for us to end today. And um, even though we started off with a lot of, I think, realism um, and skepticism about things, you all make me hopeful. So thank you for being here with, with our community today. And thanks for everybody who joined us. And we hope to see you next week for Thursday Night Live again. Thanks.